Welcome back into the Homegrown Happy Hour podcast, ladies and gentlemen. On today's episode, we explore the mind of Jimbo Valentine. Jimbo, how's it going, buddy? I'm oh, doing all right. Thanks for having me. Thank you for uh, being on. I've been going through your work here lately, and whenever it comes to your mind, I would like, I don't know if I'd like to be in it for a day or not, but I'd, <laughs> I'd really want to pick it, man, because it seems like you have a lot going on up there. Mm, sometimes, sometimes too much. Sometimes <laughs> there's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it could be that way for all art, but man, you just like, you really get out there. The thing that I love most about your art is like, it, it seems like you have to think about it. Like I've got, this one set as my uh screen here oh yeah, yeah. nice I, I i love that piece by the way thank you but, but i had to when it, whenever i seen that the first time man it just it had my mind racing because it seems like you just you put a lot into one piece and it can be looked at from so many different angles i guess is that kind of like what you like to do with a lot of your work yeah definitely especially like that one you showed from that series that was a whole series that was kind of had a theme to it you know and then but other times I just like to make stuff because it looks cool it doesn't necessarily have to have a meaning to it you know yeah but the cool part about that is people tend to take away whatever they do from either thing whether it's devoid of a predetermined meaning or not you know a lot of people they already have their own stories involved with it which is always a cool thing to hear yeah, it's cool. I think that an artist, you can tell when an artist is good whenever their art is so subjective and can be interpreted so many ways. And you really, it's your style too is so unique. I've never seen anything like it. My, I was talking to my wife. I'm like, oh, I'm going to interview Jimbo. And she was like, oh, what does he make? I'm like, oh, he makes art. She's like, well, what's it look like? And I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, how do you explain what he does? If nobody has ever seen your work, like, how would you explain your style? I guess. I don't know. It's, it's just a mixture of stuff. Like whether, however I make the pieces, sometimes they're just like reappropriated images, kind of collage style, you know, digitally. And then sometimes it's illustration and photography, and sometimes it's a mix of all of that stuff. And then, you know, I do a lot of psychedelic tinged stuff, but, you know, I also have a lot of stuff that's not as well. But so I don't, I don't really know how to describe it, honestly. <laughs> but, and, but that's, that's the way I like it, honestly. I, I'd rather be it hard to describe, you know, instead yeah. of easy to nail down. Yeah, well, I think that people can nail it down like in their with their own interpretations. They can get yeah. their own thing from it. There's one piece that I really like of yours. I, I can't ex exactly say what it is on there, but there's a man on stage with a puppet. Oh yeah, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, a, yeah. that's <laughs> an old one. I, I loved that one though because you know, like me doing the work that I do, I can definitely get my own. Uh, ideas interpretations yeah. from that piece but i think that no matter really what anybody has going on in their life if they dive into your artwork and what you do they can it's it's so relatable to a lot of people yeah i mean shockingly that's one thing i have learned is that sometimes when i think something is just too weird or it's just i don't know someone will come by and just be like that's the thing they identify with and you know once again people generally have their own reasons and these their own connections to it maybe not what i intended and that's that's a just a really cool thing because it's it's cool to see other perspectives on stuff that comes out of your own brain mm -hmm. from time to time and it i don't know it just helps just helps me grow as a person, I guess. So how did you develop your style? Like how long did that take to uh, manifest? I mean, I don't know. I, for starters, I, I never really wanted to try to have a style. Like mm -hmm. I, 
really admire people that are able to get a style and then like adhere to that and just like interpret all kinds of different works through that style. But for me, I'm always like, I wanted to be able to have a little more open boundaries and do something in whatever style I feel like, or to just try things out. And so it just came from a lot of experimenting and a lot of early, like just messing around with Photoshop and, you know, and then once you get like your techniques and you explore how far you can push those, it tends to like start repeating itself through your work. And then it just over a few years, you just start developing a style and yeah. it's not even something on purpose. It's just something that comes from uh, the way I work and the way I, that I have learned, but by teaching myself how to do most of this stuff. And it's just how it's ended up. How then long, I, well, how long have you been doing this for? Uh, since about 2006, 2007. It's like the first time I made, uh, I started learning Photoshop. It was like the first time I'd made like a poster for anybody. And I was doing like learning how to screen print and stuff at the time. And then it's just since then, it's been about 2010. I started doing posters at the V Club in Huntington. And ever since then, it's been like a whole different thing, like the second phase or whatever. But you've done something like very uh, unique in this area. And it's, it's, it's so cool. I've noticed it the first time whenever uh, I started really getting into Tyler Children's. Uh, my wife, she bought me the Country Squire on a vinyl a few years back, and I, I loved the artwork of it, but I, I didn't know who you were at the time. But I was thinking like, oh, I was thinking this was somebody out in LA or somebody really good in Nashville or something. I would have never guessed Huntington, West Virginia, though. But ever since then, man, I've been a really big fan of your artwork. How did you uh, start getting involved with local artists like, you know, Tyler and Sean Whiting, Lightback, all those guys? How did the relationship with music start? I mean, that really just came from when I started working at uh, doing posters for the V Club. And that started because, like I said, I had been learning how to screen print and I was a big uh, clutch fan and I used to be on a clutch message board back in the day and um, I just I got hooked up with doing a screen printed poster for their show at the V Club and so I did this poster and the show was awesome and everything but then afterwards Pat who owns the V Club found out that the person that made that poster lived in town so he hired me to do some murals at the V Club and then that turned into doing posters for them. And then ever since then, it's just, you know, it's networked itself through the music scene. And, you know, like people like Tyler, he's just one of those people like, I was there the first time he ever came to V Club and played open mic night. Cause we, you know, I was there all the time. And like, that was just one of those things that just happened organically. Like he started coming there and I was doing posters with him on it as you know as he started opening up for people and stuff like that and then just came i started doing you know merch designs for him and then the first red barn radio album releases like the original ones we did and like did them ourselves and like all that stuff and like it just went from there part of it's just being in the right place at the right time i guess i don't yeah. i don't really know it's funny how the universe works sometimes. That's, that's how I like to sum it up. It's, it's a weird world we live in. Is that a partnership, though, that's still ongoing? Are you going to continue working with Tyler? Because I think I that y'all's styles just, they blend so well. Yeah, I mean, you know, now he's obviously a lot bigger now. and They have some other people doing art and stuff. And uh, we, we have, like, Tony Moore. He helped, you know, do the art for Country Squire and... Uh, he's still in the mix and like I just did some the uh, Tyler's hunting hoodies they put out yeah I did a design for that on the back of it and like so it's one of those things I think we still got some miles to go like it's been a cool experience though having him put my art up at Red Rocks and 
at the Ryman on the stage as the backdrop. And it was just, you know, I mean, it's been an amazing experience. Yeah, I love, I love how uh, artists nowadays are working together so much. No matter what you know, platform that you're on, it, it seems to be a lot more camaraderie in the art scene in Appalachia, I feel like. Oh, yeah, big time. I mean, and there's a lot of crossover between music and visual arts. And, like, I mean, in Huntington, for both, we've always had a great supportive community for like the arts and like for like and I'm talking and I'm not just talking about like museum of art type stuff I'm talking about like people making art in their bedrooms kind of stuff you know and like just putting themselves out there and like it's always been very so many supportive people like whether they make art or not and people come to the shows you know People used to come to the shows when there was only 10 people at the show, you know, those people that have been there, yeah. you know, like, but that grows and they bring more people in and it's just, I don't know. It's one, there's a lot of problems in this area, but that's not one of them. That's for sure. And, and I love how you, uh, you know, highlight a lot of those problems in your works too. And man, you have so much going on. Like whenever I got into you, I just thought that you were, you know, a graphic design artist. But then whenever I, I found your website, I started going down the rabbit hole of the, the comic books that you've uh, created, a lot of the music videos that you helped work on. Like what all do you do, man? What's under the big umbrella of Jimbo Valentine? Um, well, I mean, I just, I do graphic design, uh, you know, I'll do, I, sometimes, I like to paint and draw and stuff, but I don't do as much of that anymore because I do a lot of digital stuff. But I also use like my iPad to draw and do illustrations. So it's just kind of changed over. But I also like to, I've been learning how to do videos and like Adobe Premiere and like After Effects. And like, that's all kind of a stuff that I really want to do, but I just need to get better at, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but like my whole art thing with the name of it is Amalgam Unlimited and amalgam just means like a mixture of things and unlimited means, you know, like no boundaries. And that's just kind of the thing I've always adhered to for my work of, if I want to do this, I'll learn how to do it. Maybe I'll be good at it. Maybe I won't be, but you know, it's fun to learn things and try. I love the name Amalgam Unlimited too. That like really stuck out to me. Like, oh, that's unique. I'd never heard anything like that. Where did you get that name from? Where did that come from? Um, I don't know. I I have a music project called Soul of the Phoenix that I used to do. Is a lot of like uh, stuff with samples and collage stuff, and then like some like guitar and synth stuff later on, and drum machine and stuff. But I I made a I just always liked that word amalgam like and I made this music like like EP or something and it was kind of themed around this idea of the amalgam as like a being mm -hmm. and then when I was going to Marshall for a little while I was taking business classes and we had to like I was taking an entrepreneurship class and we had to do a, like a presentation of a business that we wanted to do so I just kind of like did the presentation on the thing that I wanted to do, which was all this art stuff and screen printing and all this. And I needed a name and that just kind of carried over from the music project. And I don't know, it just, there wasn't any really other choices that just came to me and that's what it's been ever since. It, it's, it suits it, man. It really does. And speaking about uh, soul of the Phoenix, man, that music is wild. <laughs> when it, whenever I whenever I went down the rabbit hole on your website, man, and I heard re release the drones, yeah, <laughs> I, I have I have a pretty good sound system in here, and I just like I, I turned it up real loud, and man, like my heart was going, like just the anticipation of the drop, like I didn't know what was going to happen next. It's almost like you're listening to a movie, man. Yeah. The, the the music you done just creates pictures in your mind. And dude, I really dig your music. Thank you. I mean, that's one of those things that's like literally like I am not a musician at all. Like I can 
figure out things on guitar that sound good together, but I don't know what notes they are. I, I don't know how to play anybody else's music. I know how to like layer things until it sounds good. Yeah. And that's basically how all that stuff was created. And a lot of that early stuff is like, there's a lot of samples I would get from like, you know, you just buy like a DVD that has like 5,000 samples on it or something. Yeah. And mix those with like some layers of guitar and like stuff like that. And I don't know. It, I, the music thing was always cool because it's, it helped me get stuff out that I couldn't get out doing visual art. Mm -hmm. And so it was just kind of like another release for me, really. It was dope though, man. And, and I do a lot of similar music. I, I use a lot of like synthesizers and stuff like that, but I'm the same way. I don't know anything about chords. I don't know anything about progressions or harmonies or anything. Yeah. I just like if it sounds good, it sounds good. I've got so <laughs> yeah. many musician friends that are like, "Oh, this is a G flat or whatever." I'm like, "I, I yeah. guess I don't know. It, it sounds <laughs> like, good. Cool. It, it fit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever, dude. I, I, I'm 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 jealous of people that like are so, you know, so musically talented that like they they can hear. An, I was talking with a, a a musician the other day. He's like he can hear whenever somebody opens their door and the ding of it he knows like what that is. And I'm like, how the hell, how do you know what that is? That, that blows my mind. But I'm, I'm sure that people feel the same way whenever it comes to your art. Like I was really blown away from it, man. Like the, the piece that I showed you that I have is my home screen on my phone. I look at a piece like that and I'm like, where the hell do you even begin? I, 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 that, I can't wrap my mind around like, how do you even start this type of a process? So whenever you're working on some of your art where do you begin um i don't know it's sometimes uh i'll have a i'll just get an image in my head whether it just sometimes it comes out of nowhere sometimes it's just inspired by a song or a, a movie or something or something that happens and then i'll just start exploring that trying how see how I can bring that to life and you know sometimes it depends too because you know if I make stuff for a, a musician or something I have their music to inspire me you know and then like yeah. stuff like that and sometimes it just comes from finding a cool image and just start trying to break it down and isolate it, you know elements of it and just messing around with it and yeah it's usually somewhere in between those two things and sometimes i i get lucky and like i'll just get basically a fully formed image in my brain and i can bring it to life and i'm like oh my god that's pretty close to what it started as other times you start something and it'll take like you know like a hard right turn in the middle of it once you start kind of experimenting yeah. and it'll end up something completely different than it started as but you know there's no real determined process for it it just kind of happens organically that's cool man how long like does it usually take you to finish a piece uh it just depends i mean some posters sometimes if i really know what i'm doing or have the idea like i'll get them done in like a couple hours but then sometimes i'll spend days on a poster or, you know, if it's album art, usually I'll spend days on that trying to really, you know, make a cohesive thing. And it honestly just depends. And it depends on, too, like now, I, ever since I got an iPad, I've been doing a lot more illustration and digital painting and stuff. And that's much more time consuming. So if I'm doing some of that stuff now, it takes, you know, all, twice as long sometimes. Yeah. but i it's cool because now i'm able to like really bring things to life the way i see them in my brain has there been like one piece that has been the hardest to do so far i don't know if i can even talk about this but the wooks have a new album coming out and i did a piece on the inside of it that is like probably one of my favorite things i've ever done and i spent a lot of time on it trying to like get it right and like Hopefully when people see it, they'll appreciate it because I did spend a lot of time on it, like 
within a lot like I did that like maybe like two months ago or something I don't remember but it took me like probably a couple weeks of, of really going back to it and like you know sometimes you got to work on it let it marinate for a minute and then go back yeah. to it and you know work on it a little bit more and it's a process of you don't want to just do it as fast as possible because mm-hmm. you want it to be like extra good or whatever and that was one that really i put a lot of time into and i was really proud of how it turned out that's cool it's like we said earlier it's weird how the universe works out because your podcast is going to air right after the wooks podcast actually oh, nice. so yes yeah, so that, that's what i had on a, a harry from uh, the Wokes just the other day. Uh-huh. And man, they make some great music. Oh yeah. They're so good, so so good. Like I they're ones I've been really happy to ha- you know, had a working relationship with cuz I love their music and their show so much and they're just all great people and all the various lineups through the last few years, you know, they're all great people and uh, I've got to do some really really stuff stuff that i'm really proud of with those guys yeah man i I can't wait for the new album i encourage everybody to go check it out and it's cool too how you work with so many different artists what all type of music are you into man i mean i listen to all kinds of stuff i mean i don't want to be one of those people i'm like i listen to everything but you know i can generally find something i like within different genres you know yeah and uh but I listen to a lot of rock and a lot of indie stuff and stoner rock and a lot of country and old school country, bluegrass stuff. And some days it just depends. I like dancing music. I love dancing. I love, yeah. you know, just fun, uplifting beats. And like, you know, I love hip hop, lots of different hip hop, especially like nineties hip hop. I mean, you know, that's my generation there, but, uh, I don't know. That's why I'm, I feel so lucky to be able to work with so many different people and working at the V club, I got to make posters for like literally every genre of music. And like, that's always just been a great thing because I love music, but also it's helped open me up so creatively over the years. Yeah. Yeah, man. You, your art can you know, span all types of genres. I, I can see every single genre kind of fitting in to that platform there is the v i've never been to the v club i've always wanted to get a chance to go up there didn't they just rename themselves to something else yeah it's called the loud now loud okay and it's still owned by the same people they just renovated it and uh wanted to just change the name to kind of breathe some fresh air into it and there's going to be like a pizza place in there eventually so you'll be able to get some food while shows are going on and everything but yeah it was the v club for i don't know 15 years or something i'm not sure i i did stuff for me like 11 years of it i think i started there like 2009 and i don't know it's kind of weird it's weird when Mm -hmm. you the place you've been going all all this time and you walk in now it's like kind of different like part of it looks the same and then other parts are different. And like, I, I explained it to a few people, it's like, you know, like when you're in a dream and you're like, you're like at your grandma's house in the dream and then you like turn and you're like at the mall yeah, and, yeah. or something, but it all makes sense in like this dream logic. It's like that when you go and you're like, I recognize this, but this is all different. And you know, it's, it's different, but it's not a bad thing. It's just now you're gonna have to like, help build the legacy as the loud yeah yeah i I got a bunch of buddies that go up there and and do shows and stuff and they've said nothing but great things about all the changes and stuff and also just a great name too the loud ah such a great name for a club i think yeah it's like he uh pat named it after it's he connected it because he also owns black sheep burritos and bonhoff Mm -hmm. which are a couple great restaurants here in town and he also has Bad Shepherd Brewery, and the Loud is one of the beers there. So it kind of like mm. connects it all together. Yeah, I love uh, Black Sheep, man. Some of the best burritos in the world. Yeah, it's, it's good. 
Yeah, you know, Huntington's been a special place. I know that, you know, throughout the years it's had its ups and downs, but it seems like lately I just got a chance to go up there last Sunday. And, man, that town has really grown. It has a lot going on here lately. Yeah, it's a, there's people trying to do some good stuff, and we've had some, like, some really good restaurants open up lately. And, like, there's people trying to do – build it back up because it, it was definitely kind of on the down – slide there a little bit but last few years we've gotten some really good restaurants and stuff and lots of cool little shops and people just trying to do the stuff they want to do you know instead of yeah. working for the man or whatever yeah it's there's been a lot of like uh i guess the pandemic really kicked that off is you know uh, local businesses just sprung up here everywhere like people yeah. becoming their own bosses doing their own thing kind of trying stuff out and it's i think that's one good thing that came out of the pandemic Absolutely. it made people really reevaluate how we live our lives how we you know what how much crap we can eat from people you know like we only have one chance at life we're only here one time as far as we really know and mm -hmm. no one wants to grind their bones into dust working for someone else for you know crumbs when if they have the opportunity to try to open their own business, like go for it, you know, try yeah. to do the thing that's going to make you happy. And at least then you know that you tried and, you know, hopefully it does work out. You know, it doesn't always work out, but that's, you know, no risk, no reward. Exactly, man. Life's all about taking chances. And I think the people have just realized that, you know, these big corporations, you're working for people that don't know anything about this area and really at the end of the day, don't care about you and your family. No. And so many people are realizing that, hey, if I get a good website and I'm good at what I'm doing, I can make a living all on my own. I guess the, the internet is really the big thing that has been, that's made that possible. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's opened up so many doors. Yeah. And I mean, you know, not just in big cities, but in rural areas and yeah. like around here. And I mean, granted, not at, still a lot of Appalachia doesn't have like great internet and stuff, but they, they, a lot, a lot of them still have internet or, you know, phones or whatever. And it enables people to just connect. And now you're able to directly connect with, you know, creators and people like musicians and whatever and like it's yeah. and you know a lot of there's a lot of faults that comes with technology and social media and other things but the connective thing that it brings is transformed humanity i mean you know now people in appalachia can sell stuff to people in europe or you know across the world and it's like not a big deal at all you know it's like it's pretty cool. I yeah, mean, and, and you never know what's going to be. That's for sure. Yeah, and you never know what's going to be successful either. I, I got a family member that's really into knitting and stuff, and yeah. I, I'm not going to say how much money she makes, but she does good. I, I, yeah. I just say that. And who would have ever thought that you know knitting take she brought took that up during the pandemic and is now making a living off of it. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, you don't have to be no big corporation like Walmart or anything like that if you're good at work, woodworking. Yeah. Or like you do with your art or anything, find what you're good at, you know, and make your hobby a job and be yeah. your own boss. It's a great and time to be wanna, alive. Yeah. People want to support each other. And, you know, like talking about the musical and art community. I mean, that stuff is widespread, especially through Appalachia. Like uh, Appalachian people are like some of the, literally the most supportive people you'll ever meet. Like they're always there to give you a helping hand or whatever you know but like they love supporting each other so yeah. they would rather buy a knitted something from somebody they know or someone in their area than go to target and buy it for that you know for like more money but less quality and it exactly. was probably made in a sweatshop you know Exactly. And like people don't want to really support that kind of stuff anymore. They'd rather support each other if they can. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, and that's one thing too. That's an in interesting uh, point that you brought up there is how this stuff is made. 
I, I've watched a few documentaries here recently about fast food and, and stuff like that. And I'm just like, dang, I've been eating this. You know, like it just, it kind of like opens your eyes to the products that you're wearing or you're consuming or whatever, yeah. really how that's being made. And you're like, do I really want to be a part of this? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think that, I don't even know if something like this could like could be in a big city like New York. Like how, like how you're talking about how everybody wants to help support everybody so they'll buy from their local businesses or if they have a website or something like that. I wonder if something like that could even happen in a city like New York or I Chicago. Know. I don't know, man. I, don't I mean, know. I kind of feel like, I, I feel like it probably does because it's not like Appalachian or rural people have a monopoly on helping each other, you know. But I bet in bigger cities, it's more like insulated, like smaller communities, you know, mm, because, yeah. you know, I think a lot of big cities, you you know, people live in New York, half of them don't go outside their neighborhood or whatever, you know, for the most part. So I feel like they probably is, but it's more like as far as like West Virginia and Kentucky and like, you know, Southern Ohio is like kind of one big community you know i feel like in a bigger city it would be broken down into much smaller ones i get what you're saying that makes sense because i've watched a lot of mafia movies yeah and there's always <laughs> the five families that rule new york city that yeah. makes sense man <laughs> I, I also wanted to ask too is jimbo valentine your real name well i mean jimbo is just my nickname but my name's james my real name <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was yeah, my real name is James name. Valentine. I'm actually James Valentine the oh, third, and my fancy. dad he was a lot of people call him Jimbo too. And then when I was in like high school, I had some friends that moved next door that became our best friends, and they started calling me Little Jimbo and calling him Big Jimbo, and then mm -hmm. it just kind of stuck. So now I just use it too. But so I'm like. I'm James Valentine the third, but I'm like Jimbo Valentine the second, because I don't think my grandpa or anybody called him Jimbo. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't. Maybe they didn't have cool nicknames like that back in the day. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm so disappointed. I thought I thought that you were about to have the greatest name on planet Earth, but also, I mean, Valentine's probably like the coolest last name you can have. Well, until uh, it's Valentine's Day and. Then when you have to listen to years and years of people going, is today your birthday? <laughs> that, that, that gets pretty old. But otherwise, I'm fine with my name. <laughs> well, I, I got Griffith, though. So everybody asks me if I'm related to Andy and all, all of that. But one time when I was like, I think I was like 15 or 16, I was young and dumb. I charged somebody like five bucks for an autograph because I told him I was Andy's cousin. So it, it, it has worked to my benefit in the future. I don't do shady stuff like that nowadays. Whenever I was 15, I made $5. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so, so when it comes to your art and stuff like that, can people get – you know, stuff that they want done. I know that you're a busy guy and stuff, but like if they want like a self portrait or anything like that, or, or do you take requests? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's one thing. Uh, I've done some commissions for people that were like more personal stuff. I offer commissions like on my website. Um, but I mean, I'll do pretty much anything for anybody, you know, within reason. No, no racist. Yeah. So, kick that down the curb. But, uh, you know, Damn. otherwise, if you want, people want to get something weird made with their portrait or get something, you know, just nice made, as my mom used to always say, why don't you just make something that looks nice? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was... No, well, that was going to be another question that I had because, you know, like I, I love dark stuff. I, I got a very dark mind. I've went through some traumatic stuff in my life. So, so I enjoy, you know, heavy metal. I enjoy all types of music, but like, you know, dark stuff, I, I can dig it. Yeah. But, but some people that have had these great lives where everything has went good and they've had a silver spoon in their mouth their entire lives, whenever they see some artwork like yours, they can, uh, I don't know exactly what they think. Have, have you ever had anybody ask, like, 
are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, occasionally people will uh, look a little too far into things, but, you know, for the most time, I think people understand, you know. I mean, I've always just kind of tilted towards the darker stuff in life, and I've certainly had my demons, and a lot of my art does help me get that stuff out, you know, but like, you know, I was in high school drawing pictures of devils and like, whatever, serial killers and just weird horror type stuff, you know, and like, yeah. and I just remember like my art teacher being like, why do you want to draw this stuff all the time? And now people will pay me to draw that stuff for them. So, mm. you know, it's maybe not for everybody, but people do understand, you know? And like, you know, you have like my mom, who's one literally one of the nicest people of all time. And not that she hasn't always been a big supporter and appreciated my art, but you know, she'll see the darker stuff. And she just was just like, why don't you draw something nice? Like, uh, she, you know, <laughs> what about like, some flowers? Yeah. Like I Sunset. remember one time I painted something for her. She had said that to me. And as a joke, I painted her this, uh, it was like a, uh, still life of a fruit bowl mm -hmm. but i put a skull in the middle of it and I'm like <laughs> here you go you know like, <laughs> just to give her just to give her a little hell you know but man uh, yeah i would have if i if i done the stuff that you done i'd have a very hard time explaining it to my folks but you know, <laughs> But, you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, like the, the people that have, uh, you know, battled demons in life or, or been through, you know, experiences, it gives them somebody to relate to. Sometimes, like, I, I do stand-up comedy, for example, and I have a lot of really messed up thoughts sometimes, but I think they're funny. And, and, yeah. I, and I'm just like, I, I, I'm, you know, a, a piece of trash because I'm finding this joke funny, but yeah, I, I'll tell it just because I ain't got any more material at the time. And yeah. I'll tell it on stage <laughs> and you see people like pointing to other people or laughing and I'm like, oh, I'm not the only weirdo that has really <laughs> messed up thoughts. I think that your art does that for people, man. It's a really beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I certainly have a dark sense of humor too. I, I pretty can appreciate that. And that same feeling of why do I think this is funny? <laughs> What's wrong with me? You know, sometimes it's just like, I don't know. I think that's just how we deal sometimes with messed up stuff in life is all we can do is laugh about it. Even though deep down inside it's scary or it hurts or it's really messed up or it, involves someone else's pain or like yeah. i don't know some sometimes something just catches you the right way and it's funny you know and it could be involving someone's death or something you know like some kind of comedic darwin death you know where someone did something really stupid and they're dead but it was funny the way they did it you know and like yeah I, I, th I think that we need those people, man. This, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to say any names, but I, I was at uh, one of my wife's family members funerals and, uh, you know, everybody was really sad and it was just, you know, people crying, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, I just seen a move and everybody died. <laughs> you know, everybody, like it just, it broke that up. And, and I think that, you know, like comedy is, is needed. It's yeah, the people absolutely. that have a really dark sense of humor those people are needed because yeah. in times of absolute misery, those are going to be the people that make you laugh. Yeah. You know, the joke might not be the right time at all the time, but every once in a while, <laughs> yeah. you'll, you'll get a good one. Uh, it's true. <laughs> but man, but man, really, I, I really enjoy what you're doing. And I thank you for all the great artwork and for the people that want to check it out, you know, and, and learn more and dive into the mind of Jimbo Valentine, where do they go to do so? I can go to my website, amalgamunlimited.com. It has a lot of needs, a little updating from stuff from like the past year, but it's got a no shortage of stuff on there to go through and you can access my videos and music and all that stuff on there. Or you can just find me on my Facebook page and <laughs> all the stupid stuff I like to post and repost and, you know, 
all my sweet dreams posts and you know all that kind of messed up weird stuff i mean you know or or also on instagram where there's a good mix of art and weirdness i do give you the credit of being right now my meme king like every time that i see you have a story there on instagram i'm like it's going to be good <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm always looking forward to it, man. You have some of the best memes on planet Earth, but also some of the, the, the best art too, man. So uh, th thank you for all that you do, brother. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank, and thank you for what you do. I uh, think it's really cool. I, I remember watching, didn't you do one, the interview with Laidback? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've had Laidback yeah. and, um, well, and old David and Teresa up here quite, yeah, yeah. quite a few times. I love those. Yeah, days. that was a really good one. And Yeah, I mean you can't find two better people in the world. I mean, I dare you, <laughs> you know, like they're just some of the best people of all time. So genuine too. Like, like maybe like there's some people that like I can see that are being nice and they're faking it. And I'm yeah. like, oh, you, you fake. But, yeah. it, but with David and Teresa, the very first time I met them, they were, it was just so genuine. They are the most yeah. loving, genuine, what you see is what you get people around here. And yep. with them being who they are, they should not be that way. You'd think they have a little bit of ego. No, no, they're yeah. some of the most normal people on planet Earth. Oh, yeah. They're, I mean, they're just, they're amazing for real. But you are too, my friend. And Jimbo, thank you for your time today, brother. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me.